Welcome to Drone Law Pro. Today we are here with Rob Dreer, and Rob is a uh, paralegal, SUAS paralegal for Traverse Legal and DroneLaw.pro. He is also a flight instructor over at uh, Northwestern Michigan College, uh, which has a SUAS program, and he teaches a variety of SUAS uh, classes over there. Welcome to the show, Rob. Good morning, Enrico. So, so Rob, we have a lot of clients who uh, are, have either obtained their Section 333 exemption or are in the process of getting their exemption. And one of the things we like to do is to help educate them concerning uh, how to fly within the exemption. And I always tell people that their focus will quickly shift from getting the exemption to flying within the 30 plus conditions and limitations that will be included in the exemption. So today I want to talk a little bit about the requirement to file a what's called a notice to airmen, a NOTAM, within 24 to 48 hours of your flight uh, before putting a drone in the air. You have to file one of these NOTAMs for each flight or for each operation. So Rob, tell us a little bit about what a NOTAM is and why the FAA wants Section 333 commercial drone operators to file one. So the, the notice to airmen or NOTAM is a tool used by manned aviators so that they can be made aware of situations that may affect them uh, in any given an airspace that they're flying in. So the way the NOTAMs are designed to work is you call into a flight briefer or you can go on to the automated flight briefer website and you give them certain pieces of information regarding certain blocks of airspace that allow specific hazards or high volume operations uh, and things of that nature like air shows for instance you would issue a notum for a heavy volume of flight traffic flight training uh, and there's uh, airport closures and all sorts of other types of situations where you'd want to be made aware of a special condition uh, before you fly yeah, and so we want to think of the NOTAM as this giant database of information about what's going on in a particular airspace at a particular time. And so, you know, everyone who's, you know, the, who is operating or related to airspace is supposed to file information, put information into this database so that airports and air traffic controllers and pilots uh, and drone operators can see what's happening in the airspace. So for instance, uh, TFR uh, would be uh, one of the items that might show up in a NOTAM, correct? That is correct, and that's a really good point, Enrico. Uh, oftentimes there are hazards that um, you know pilots need to be made aware of. For instance, uh, we have all these situations out west where the forest fighter aircraft, uh, the firefighting aircraft are getting grounded because UAS operators are up trying to see you know, what's going on. We have a lot of curious hobbyist users out there. Um, so a forest fire is one instance where a TFR would be issued. And so TFRs can be used as a planning tool for the UAS operator so that you can see where you can and can't fly. But they're also a notification tool for the manned aviators so that they know what areas to avoid. Of course, we don't want any incursions. So it's important for us to know where we can't fly it's important to let other people know where we are so that they can avoid our areas as well so we could be uh, joint shared uh, responsible users of the airspace. Yeah, and so drone pilots need to think of the NOTAM as, as, as a two-way a two communication structure. Number one, they're going to get information when they think, okay, I'm going to go put my drone in the air at this location at this time on this date. They're going to be able to get information about uh, hazards or TFRs or restrictions or uh, things that are going on in that airspace. And they are also putting their information into the system so that everyone else can see what they're doing, correct? That is correct, Enrico. For instance, I recently filed a NOTAM for one of our local areas, and one of our, my fellow flight instructors here at the college, he saw it pop up when he did his pre-flight checks, and he actually emailed me. He said, hey, Rob, is this you? And I said, yes. And in addition to uh, what that says, I'll actually be out here and ending a little bit early. And so he knew uh, from from contacting me that I would be not using that airspace the whole time. And so here at the college, we're able to foster a very professional working environment between our manned aviators and our unmanned aviators. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about um, what has to happen in terms of, of filing the NOTAM and how you go about doing that. Now, the, the requirements for drone operators is to file a NOTAM 
uh, 20, in the period between 24 and 48 hours of their flight, correct? Yeah, that is correct. And so when you do that, you're going to want to take into account um, you don't want to wait until 24 hours prior to your flight because you're cutting it rather close. So I would actually go more towards the 48 hours. And it makes a lot of sense that we need to do it that far out, at least 24 hours out, because that allows uh, the people who might do pre-flight planning the day prior for, say, a morning flight to actually see that pop up in the system. Oftentimes, um, when you do a, a pre-flight check in the morning, you might be a little bit rushed, a little bit hurried. I know I've had my long cross-country flights that I've done in the morning where I'm trying to get and process all this information. So the more info that you can see earlier, the better. Yeah, and so I, I'm, I'm a, a drone operator. I've got uh, five flights planned. Uh, between Wednesday and Friday of this week, it's a Monday, uh, I can now start pl uh, filing notams for my Wednesday flights, and on Tuesday I can start filing notams for my Thursday flights, etc. And I'm going to be filing notams for a particular flight or a particular operation. If I have multiple flights or multiple operations, I'm going to be filing multiple notams. Now there's a little bit of flexibility there in terms of, well, if I'm going to be flying in a downtown area throughout the day, five different flights uh, over a period of four hours, theoretically you could put in a notam for all of those operations. Um, there's some flexibility within the system and there's some gray area which uh, which is out there. But the main point is you the, the, you want to follow the fundamental rule that you, if you're going to file a notum, the point is to let other people know that your drone is going to be flying in a particular airspace, and so you don't want to get too broad with your notums because they don't want you, they don't want you putting a, a, a saying that your aircraft is going to be flying in an airspace when in fact it's not. Uh, and so, tell us a little bit, Rob, about what it is a drone operator will need to do in order to file a notum. How does that happen? So if you want to go and file a NOTAM, the, the first thing you're going to have to figure out before you ever make the call is where exactly you're going to fly. You alluded to the fact that you want to find out uh, a general geographic area of where you're going to fly. If we're talking an area like Traverse City and you have the proper authorization to fly in that area, uh, I wouldn't recommend issuing a specific NOTAM for each maybe house in each neighborhood that you're going to fly. If you have a base geographic area of, say, five, perhaps eight miles, that would make sense to just file one NOTAM and just give them the center point of where you're going to be operating and then your entire radius of that area. Um, aircraft cover a lot of ground really fast, so they don't really necessarily need to know each individual location you're flying. Now, if you're talking several areas, say you're in the Chicagoland area, and you have a couple of flights on the north end of the metro, and then you have a couple of flights on the south end of the metro, of course it would make more sense to define areas to the north and the south and what times you're actually going to be operating in those areas so that your location is more specific and pinpointed. Because like you said, you don't want to say, I'm going to be flying somewhere in the state of Michigan from the hours of sunrise to sunset because that doesn't help anybody at all. Sure. So in the Chicagoland example, you would you would recommend filing two NOTAMs in that instance, uh, morning flights in, in the, the, the south end, for instance, and afternoon flights as a separate NOTAM in the, uh, uh, in the system, correct? Uh, yes. And if we have our, our larger uh, corporate users out there, and, you know, they may be doing multiple operations at one time. And so maybe it makes sense to have both of those active at the same time as well. Yeah. So how does someone file a NOTAM? How do, how do you do that? So you would go on, once you have the, the location information, you would go on and you could use the 1-800-WX-BRIEF, 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF, or you can go on the uh, online website, www.wxbrief.com, and that will allow you to get in contact with uh, Lockheed Flight Service Briefer. They are the subcontractors who manage our flight service system. And when you contact them, you're going to let them know what state that you're going to process your NOTAM for. And that allows them to pinpoint specifically who you need to talk to that's a specialist in your area. Right. And so you can either call or you can do it online. And if you call, there's going to be a representative on the other end who's going to ask you a series of questions. If you go online, you'll fill out some data fields uh, and th get the information uh, into the NOTAM that way, correct? 
That is correct, and I actually prefer doing it uh, over the telephone because the the flight service briefers are there to help you. They could do sort of a sanity check to make sure your information is correct. So when you when you call these individuals, they're going to ask you several key pieces of information, and one of those information is going to be location of where the flight is going to be. Now, they are going to need that location in reference to a navigational aid. <clears throat> a navigational aid could be something like a VOR. It could be a non-directional beacon. Um, so once you have that navigational aid, for instance, in our local area, I use Tango Vicar Charlie, the Traverse City VOR. Yep. And VOR for our listeners is what? Say that one more time. The VOR for our listeners means what? Uh, very high frequency omni range, and it's a uh, it's a navigational tool used to uh, to travel from point to point using radio signal. Right. So these are these these uh, these navigational aids show up on aeronautical charts. Our uh, three 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 clients are going to be have to access these aeronautical charts in order to provide uh, a a uh, a location for the NOTAM and then to identify a radius around that navigational aid. Where, where can our clients go to find information about navigational aids? So there's several sources where you can get that information. There's the, the old antiquated paper chart system, which I do not recommend, uh, but there are several uh, electronic versions that I, that I would recommend. Uh, the most premier version that, that I love to use is ForeFlight. That's F-O-R-E-F-L-I-G-H-T. ForeFlight is an application that is a, a full-service, one-stop shop for all the aeronautical data, all the FAA publications and documentation that you could possibly want. It shows digitized maps that can be zoomed in, scaled differently. You have all the different types of aeronautical charts that you can use. It allows measuring. It allows you to see... Uh, whether or not an airport has an instrument procedure, an air traffic control tower, which we know is an important factor in, in our COA process and where we can and can't fly. Sure, and so they'll go to uh, ForeFlight, F-O-R-E-F-L-I-G-H-T dot com, uh, or they'll download it on their uh, on their iPhone or Android operating system, and then they can use that software to identify where they want to fly, locate the nearest navigational aid, be able to tell uh, the uh, the representative uh, at Lockheed uh, where they're going to be flying in relation to that that aid, and and then from there they'll provide some other information. Is that correct? That is correct. And of course, there's a free subscription for those of you who want to give it a trial go before you actually buy it. And then if if it determine that you're really not in your business model to buy that there are also some free versions of that uh, like skyvector.com um, that has information uh, a lot of the same information just in a less readily easily usable form yeah and so what other kind of information is the FAA looking for on these notums uh, that <clears throat> people are going to have to be able to provide when they either call or use the online system to identify a flight yeah, so once you've identified what navigational aid you're going to use, you are going to find a bearing, uh, a direction from that navigational aid, and uh, oftentimes those charts have those uh, in, a, in a compass dial around it. And so you'll determine your, your direction. So, for instance, say north, and you could say I am on the 360-degree uh, radial, which is a direction uh, according to the a compass heading from that navigational aid, and then you'll give them a distance. So, for instance, if someone out in Traverse City was operating over the old Mission Peninsula, they could say, I was operating on the 360-degree radial north of the Traverse City VOR, uh, 30 miles on a 360-degree bearing. Right, and they're going to want your contact information and, your, for instance, your name and a way to contact you in case there's uh, some, some conflicting um, operations in the area so that people can coordinate those things, correct? Yes, they would. And so other pieces of information they need in addition to your name and phone number is they're going to need uh, the, the radius defined, defining the working area that you're going to be at from that location. 
they're going to need your maximum altitude, which under the blanket COA is 200 feet. So you could say surface to 200 feet AGL would be the format you'd give them. And then they're going to need the time, which defines uh, your your working area. When when are you going to be there? When is that going to be a hazard to other aviation users? Right. So Lockheed Martin, they're the subcontractor for the FAA on NOTAM. So it's their job to get the information and run the NOTAM system. And they've got this this great uh, operation called Flight Service, which is they're there to help you. They're there to take your information and guide you through the process. Our recommendation is as you start to work through the administrative portion of being a drone operator and running a drone service is to start to get a feel for the NOTAM system. Uh, go ahead and you can you can file a, a NOTAM if you're a recreational user as well, can't you? Yes, you can. Uh, as a matter of fact, the NOTAM can be used anytime that you know that there may be a hazard or, or a special situation that would uh, cause interference with other uh, airspace users. Uh, model rocketry clubs, they could file NOTAMs for the operations they do. So if you are out practicing, for instance, you know, getting ready in advance of your 333 and acting as a hobbyist, just practicing flying, you could actually practice your workflows and develop those workflows uh, for gaining a, a NOTAM by, for instance, going out and just filing a NOTAM for a flight for just an hour so you're not taking up a lot of airspace, but you're also uh, letting people know where you're flying and you're getting used to how the, the, the NOTAM system works. And it'll make you a much more efficient UAS operator in the long run by by starting issuing these NOTAMs now. Right. So commercial operators, they have to file NOTAMs 24 to 48 hours in that range. Recreational uh, drone operators do not, but you still can and you should because once you get your Section 333 exemption, you're going to want to get at it and start uh, and start charging customers and, and running uh, drone flight operations. And you're going to need to understand how to file a NOTAM, how that NOTAM system works. Rob, uh, great having you on the show today. Thanks so much for all your valuable insights. And we will see you next time on DroneLaw.pro.